Okay, ma'am, please go ahead. Right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants, uh, respected speaker, and everyone present in the afternoon session of the 21 Days Winter School. So it is my proud privilege to introduce you before the uh, esteemed speaker of uh, the day, Dr. Rajveer Singh Pavaiya. He is a renowned pathologist, and currently he is working as the principal scientist and head division of pathology at ICR IVRI Izatnagar. So, brief profile of the uh, Dr. Pavai I'll be presenting. He did his BVSc and AH from College of Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry, Jabalpur, and his MVSc and PhD from ICR IVRI Izatnagar. And he has done his postdoc from Grenada. And uh, later on, he joined the Agriculture Research Service. Uh, in 1996, and he served in several ICR institutes uh, before joining at uh, uh, Bareilly. And uh, Dr. Pavaiya, he has handled and completed 21 research projects, and he has been uh, involved in the development of two IT-based database software, 10 technologies, including one patent uh, that has been obtained, and one uh, technology has been commercialized, and there are five new genes uh, he has identified along with his team. And he has been involved in several institutional building and administrative service functions. Uh, he has a uh, lot many awards to his credits, different recognitions. To name a few, I would like to inform you that he has got the CM, Dr. CM Singh Award in 2004 for the best PhD scholar of IVRI. Then the very prestigious ICR Jawaharlal Nehru Award in 2005. Then he's a diplomat of Indian College of Veterinary Pathologists. He's fellow of Indian Association of Veterinary Pathology. He's fellow of National Academy of Veterinary Sciences India, fellow of Society of Immunology and Immunopathology. And he has been the editor of Indian Journal of Veterinary Pathology. And uh, he has been teaching uh, many courses of veterinary pathology, particularly the general pathology. And he has uh, an expertise in tumors as well. And uh, he has published 321 research and technical publications, including nine books or manuals, 65 book chapters, 115 research papers in national and international journals. So with this brief introduction, I would like to invite Dr. RVS Pavaya for his lecture on goat health management. Sir, please. Well, thank you, Ring. Thank you. Thank you, Ring, Dr. Rinko, for introducing me in such a big way. <laughs> though I don't consider myself uh, this much. Uh, thank you very much. So I think, uh, am I audible to all the audiences? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So actually, previously I was uh, posted in CIRG Magdum, the Goat Research Institute, uh, for about uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, very recently, I've joined here in Division of Pathology as head of the division. So I will be sharing my experiences on the goat health management. Uh, as we all know, the goat health management of the goat is very vital for an economically sound venture. So the collective measures undertaken for the well-being of animals so as to achieve the desired growth rate and production in a herd. The goat health management, in fact, of the prevention with a good herd health plan is usually less expensive than treating the disease. So with this uh, uh, concept of principle or theme back in our mind, uh, we can consider that herd health management or goat herd health management is a multi-determinant uh, aspects are required uh, to manage life livestock management, health, nutrition, breeding, preventive medicines, and epidemiology. So what is herd health? Herd health is a planned animal health and production management program that uses a combination of regularly scheduled veterinary activities and good herd management designed to optimize animal health and productivity. So the approach for treatment and control of disease in herd is different from that of the individual animals. Because here we mainly consider uh, the prevention of the disease. If one animal becomes ill, it is, there is very much risk of spreading it to other animals in the flock. So to prevent the spread of disease within herd, certain group control measures like vaccination, deworming, 
uh, these measures are taken and sick animals if they are there they are promptly isolated kept in a sick animal ward to prevent its spread from other animals in the herd and also uh, this facilitates proper attention and care during the treatment overcrowding uh, with less hygienic conditions of shelter can also lead to spread of contagious diseases like mange ectoparasites and pneumonia and dampness of flooring and humidity can lead to wood rot conjunctivitis and fungal and bacterial dermatitis so here we can see all aspects including shelter uh, their nutritional management the environment around everything is considered in a holistic view so here i'm uh, depicting some healthy jamnapari that are reared in crg magdum i have taken these photographs from magdum this is a barbary flock or at the crg magdum so uh, this slide shows you the multi multiple factors that are required to manage the herd health, including environment, shelter management, farm hygiene, uh, nutritional management, farm biosafety, vaccination, and health cover, which include treatment, deworming, dipping, and like that. So coming to uh, our health management one by one, we will discuss a few things which are essential for herd management, like farm hygiene. So farm hygiene, the overall means overall cleanliness and proper waste disposal. Feed, feeder and waterer hygiene, feeding hygiene, floor hygiene, and milking hygiene. Cleanliness and waste disposal plays a significant role in overall maintenance of the farm because it reduces the risk of ticks, fleas, flies, and other pathogenic bacteria which are feeding on that. And harmful waste like hospital wastes or dressings, first materials, they have to be incinerated or burnt or disposed of properly so that the risk of spreading, uh, to check the risk of uh, spreading again to health animals. Similarly, feeder and water hygiene, mangers and waterers, they should be periodically clean using detergents and oxidizing agents and to reduce the risks as fomites. Because, or for example, or for contagious ectima is one disease where scabs are usually they are dropped in feeder or water. So, by oral route, this disease, of course, it is a contagious disease and zoonotic to some extent. So, in that way, we can check such such diseases if you uh, continuously or periodically clean your feeder and waterers. Then. Even feed and water leftover should also be dumped and cleared, which may come contain not only harmful toxins, but also harmful bacteria also. Then clean, clean and hygienic feeders, so these are the photographs we can show you. This, this is the uh, animal affected with or. So here we can see that these are the scabs which are produced uh, over the oak lesions. Uh, so these scabs are detergent. They, these scabs are very rich in virus. The scabs are very rich in virus and whenever they are eaten with the contaminated feed or water, they can cause disease in healthy animals. So then feeding hygiene, feeding feed moisture should be calculated frequently to check growth of fungus and, fungus and mycotoxins, especially silage. If silage is less fermented or not fully matured, it poses a risk of listeriosis. Listeria is one of the bacteria where uh, unfermented silage uh, actually enhances its replication and then grazing management change of grazing area to reduce the risk of intake of contaminated grass blades with parasitic eggs so if area permits one should always uh, make a roaster uh, for grazing uh, areas and these flocks should be changed over the grazing areas continuously the rotation of grazing area is essential, right? Am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah. So then coming to water hygiene, water hygiene is must to check the snail control. Suppose the flocks are going to graze around ponds or river, uh, and also if damp areas are continuous around the uh, herd, then also it poses a parasitic infection risk, especially fasciolosis. For, for them, 
snail is an intermediate host. So water sources in and around farm premises can be treated with copper sulfate to reduce snail population. Then coming to floor hygiene, flooring and its cleaning management is very, very important because dampness in flooring can lead to the uh, food rot in sheep and goats, lameness in goats, fly attack in sheep like meiosis, and excessive moisture uh, can lead to increased survival of pathogens and usage of coccidia and other gastrointestinal parasites. Uh, also E. coli in moist fecal matters, they can spread to healthy neonates causing coli bacillosis. So in that way, floor management is essential to keep clean. And if it is a mud floor, then uh, we need to hear, I can show you the photograph of one feeder and floor uh, in our farm at CRG. Then here is one animal which has severe parasitic infection. This is, a, this is an experimental animal. So managing the floor, how to manage? Frequent disposal of the fecal matter. So regular cleaning, frequent disposal uh, of uh, fecal matter, then proper ventilation, acidifying the floor with lime by regular spreading, and spreading of cereal straw or wood shavings on the floor and then burning it. So this incineration kills the oocysts, eggs of leech, ticks, and bacterial and fungal spores. Then frequent fumigations with formalin and potassium permanganate to purify the air, kill harmful bacteria and fungal spores. And if it is a mud floor, not pakka floor, then we can change the superficial clay about 6 inch to 12 inch of thickness every 6 months uh, to keep the floor healthy and hygiene. So here you can see a sieve with severe wound and cellulitis. Uh, this, this is the picture I am showing you, uh, all, 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 all my audiences, to see how food rot occurs. This is a picture of uh, one place in Rajasthan where we went to attend the outbreak of food rot. So during rainy season, the, the, they keep them in uh, you know, uh, kacha floor or mud floor. So when floor is continuously uh, damp or wet due to rainy season, uh, we can see the food rot or food is called can occur. So this is the flock which has been very severely affected with the food rot. See here, the interdigital dermatitis, see the pus formation, uh, and many a lot of inflammation is there. See, so hoop and uh, this hoop floor, soul, soul has been uh, already damaged. So once soul is damaged, this uh, necroforum, uh, necroforus fusarium, this uh, bacteria, uh, because they are saprophytic, saprophytic bacteria, they start replicating in that dead tissue. And they make way for the dichylobacter nodosus, which is an important organism for a completely anaerobic uh, uh, on organism, which replicates in that saprophytic tissue and then that's how this food rot occurs. So see the severity of the lesions, uh, severe hemorrhages, bleeding is occurring, pus formation is there. Here you can see uh, the severe inflammation between the hoof and uh, corona. So uh, that kind of even hoof is uh, going to sloughed off after some time. And we have seen half of hoof is already sloughed in this particular picture. So food rot can be actually uh, determined by this food scoring. One scientist, Conington et al., has actually uh, devised this food scoring. So zero normal hoop, one mild interdigital dermatitis, two more extensive interdigital. So depending on severity, we can use this to determine the severity of the food rot and their lesions. Then milking hygiene, uh, milking hygiene dose should be milked in a separate area that is called milk parlor, but it is not possible everywhere, at least at farmer's place, because goats are more susceptible to mastitis due to the vicinity of the other halves to the ground. Again, the floor hygiene is important here because most often uh, the other touch with the floor. So mastitis is the main cause of poor hygiene. 
uh, main cause of my strategy is poor hygiene, contamination from fecal matter, poor milking practices, unhygienic hands, and production stress. And especially spread of the Staphylococcus aureus and cockroach negative Staphylococcus aureus, they are contagious in the sense that once they occur, they can spread to from one animal to other animal also. And that's how this mastitis can occur. You can see here one acute case, very hot swelling, red. Another one is a chronic swelling, induration of the udder, and also sometimes it becomes gangrenous and or blue band. Then shelter management, the housing management. So should be designed and constructed for all weather purpose. Optimum height and side wall for proper ventilation is required. If height is more, uh, then there could be less ventilation. If height is less, then could be hyperventilation. So that during winter, the animals can be exposed to the cold weather. Similarly, if it is very high and no ventilation is there, then ammonium production will be there. And this ammonia again will lead to the pneumonia like the cold weather. Then less height of sidewall can lead to overventilation. So this is how uh, the small ruminants are more prone to pneumonia in all weather. So pneumonia can occur in sheep and goat in all weather, including hot weather, dry or hot, humid or even severe cold. So optimum heart size is also very, very important. So limiting the heart size to optimum levels to check the overcrowding is very important from the health point of view because overcrowding, overcrowding causes faster spread of infectious and contagious diseases like seapox, woodpox, bacterial pneumonia, or mange, conjunctivitis, and even abortion. Then farm biosafety. Farm biosafety is one of the very important concepts which stresses on the possible parameters and its control to avoid the loss of valuable livestock. Biosafety and biosecurity measures are very essential in controlling diseases and other determinants which may endanger the lives of animals. So quarantine is one of the biosafety measures. So whenever uh, the new uh, animals are purchased from outside, they are kept in quarantine. Even sick animals from the group can be kept for quarantine for no biosafety purposes. So quarantine is done already existing sick herd as well as newly purchased animals. Uh, normally it is done for 30 days and during this 30 days if animals are newly purchased, you can then during this particular period, we can also vaccinate dewormant dipping work can also be done. Then for herd, proper herd management, the veterinarian or the manager of the herd should look for clinical signs. Uh, for this biosafety or security, this uh, quarantine purpose, if there is any infection, then we have to be very careful and uh, immediately they can be isolated and kept in quarantine. Similarly, the biosecurity, which can be done by limiting the test passing of uh, unwanted persons, animals and vehicles into the farm premises. Separate frisking and food dip for persons from outside can be maintained. Then domestic and wild animal intrusions in the farm, which is very possible uh, uh, carriers of infection, they should be properly checked. In C, for example, the village herd may harbor gluten virus. Suppose a nearby village in the farm is having gluten, and if season comes when mosquito uh, replicates frequently, then this blue tongue is certain to come to the farm. So proper protective region, uh, protective measures can be taken. Then nutritional management from neonates to market lambs and goats, proper nutrition is important to avoid mortality due to inanition, anemia, metabolic disease. Uh, not only this, proper nutrition is also important to maintain the immunity, proper immunity of the animal. Then introduction of concentrate to post weaned lamb and kids is very important. Rapid introduction can lead to metabolic acidosis. So slowly, slowly, uh, these kids can be brought to the concentrated feed. Uh, similarly, sudden change should always be avoided. 
to check the disease like endotoxemia or metabolic disease. Nutritional management of pregnant animals is very important to avoid ketosis and pregnancy. Toxemia, bovis, SIBA are very, very susceptible. Uh, then endotoxemia and nutritional management, so uh, which I was just uh, alluding to. This endotoxemia is precipitated by sudden and excess carbohydrate intake leading to acid production, especially in wheat growing areas uh, where animals go for grazing after wheat harvesting, we see a sudden spurt of the endotoxemia in animals, especially goats and sheep, because they eat leftover uh, wheat grains there in the field. So this acid production and low intestinal motility leads to the multiplication of Clostridium perfusions type D. Clostridium perfusions, there are many uh, type A, B, C, D, E, and others also. So specifically, this Clostridium D perfusions is very, very, uh, it uh, releases the toxin, epsilon toxin, which is very lethal. So this epsilon toxin combined with beta, beta toxin and alpha toxin, uh, can be absorbed by the intestine and touch the bloodstream and can cause a widespread hemorrhages, uh, toxemia, shock, and death. Then diseases and its management. So health cover uh, actually is very important because uh, small ruminants, they are affected mostly by pneumonia, parasitism, uh, diarrhea, endoparasitism, coli bacillosis in neonatals, mange, conjunctivitis. So these are the major diseases of uh, these animals. So uh, health cover means we have to be uh, careful, meticulous while examining or looking at the herd entering or coming out for grazing. So herd disease management can be done through three important parameters. One, diagnosing them then treatment, treating the disease after diagnosis and controlling. So control of the particular disease and its spread in the herd is uh, prevented. Uh, control can be done by vaccine and quarantine. Treatment can be done by antibiotics, by deworming, dipping. Okay, so here you can see one of the flaws uh, in Amar Kantak and uh, nearby in Chhattisgarh it is. So we went to uh, check this particular flock. One disease outbreak was there for worsens. So that we went to collect the samples. Clinical signs. Uh, animals can be checked for dullness, for anorexia if it is not eating or stopped eating, anorexia and change in feeding behavior, then seclusion, whether any diseased animal usually isolates itself from the herd from routine activities like feeding, grazing, browsing, they also lag behind the group, healthy group. So that way we can identify uh, observing by these clinical signs like nasal discharge, maybe some respiratory infections there, then rolling on the ground uh, could be due to pain in the stomach or uh, neuro, some neurological diseases uh, like listeria or opisthotonus endotoxemia then in sheep circling disease if it is circling disease then it could be listeriosis in visual warts or even sinurosis also and in goats it could be endotoxemia uh, scn poisoning could be metabolic acid acidosis and indigestion and even endotoxemia in goat also neurological signs are seen so by these clinical signs, one of one important uh, parameter is pyrexia or hypo hyperthermia. So uh, so here you can see the normal body temperature of goat ranges from 98 to 103 degree Fahrenheit. That is around 36.7 to 39.5 degrees centigrade. So any increase or decrease in temperature should be associated with other symptoms and treatment should be done immediately. If one animal is dull with pyrexia, other animals for similar clinical signs should be checked randomly to check whether this particular infection is spread to other animals or not. Then you can start with antibiotics and supportive therapy.
So here we can see the nasal discharge, which confirms PPR in zero ego. This photo is taken from a PPR affected animal. Then other symptoms like conjunctival, conjunctival mucous membrane, usually of light pink color. Normally it is light pink color, but if it is cherry red color, then it could be a CN poisoning. If it is a deep pink color with congestion, infectious disease could be there like HS. If it is pale, then it could be anemia, mostly due to gastrointestinal nematodes. If it is a rough skin coat, then it could be diarrhea or hypoproteinemia. And chronic diarrhea like JD can lead to uh, height bound condition also in goats. So here we can see the uh, conjunctiva in a goat. It is a pale affected with hemongosis. Then diarrhea. Diarrhea, see the, with the experience or with the, this thing, it, you can see if it is a uh, animal which is less than 20 days of age, the diarrhea most probably will be due to coli vesicosis. If it is after 20 days, there is all possibility of oxidosis in a neonatal kid. Then chronic intermittent diarrhea in adults, it could be Jones disease combined with the weakness and other uh, symptoms. Then shooting diarrhea, it could be APR. So that way we can see the different kind of diarrhea here. This is due to PPR, the Jones disease. You can see the condition of the animals. And uh, then you can see the uh, coli vesicosis in kids. The pneumonia. Pneumonia is most common cause of mortality in sheep and goats. It can be caused by bacteria or viruses. So bacterial causes are mycoplasma species, especially in goats, CCPP or uh, uh, which we call caprine contagious, caprine pleuropneumonia, and postural multocida, anemia hemolytica. Viral could be PPR, seedpox, woodpox. So here you can see some pathological uh, <laughs> uh, specimens, uh, maybe helpful for pathologists. Uh, you can see gross lesions of lung, bacterial pneumonia, conibacterium, pseudotuberculosis. This particular case, so here it is a viral pneumonia of PPR in goat. You can see one lung abscess is there. Supportive pneumonia, lung abscess. So, important diseases affecting small ruminants. I will discuss a little bit, not much here, because this is overall health management. So, bacterial diseases are hemorrhagic, septicemia, endotoxemia, contagious caprine pleuropneumonia, brucellosis, Jones disease, tuberculosis, ACS lymphadenitis. Similarly, viral diseases, they comprise of goat pox, sheep pox, foot and mouth disease, PPR, blue tongue, and contagious ectima or orca. Then parasitic infestations like hemoncosis, fasciolosis, monagia, oxidiosis, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and filariosis. So here you can see in this picture, uh, the complete picture of the PPR affected animal so you can see erosive lesions here uh, in the uh, gums and oral mucosa. Then uh, you can see mucus discharge from nasal. Uh, similarly, see scaling and uh, erosive lesions. So like that, uh, here you can see hemorrhagic enteritis, pneumonia affected lungs, again nasal discharge, conjunctivitis, yeah, and affected lung. Coming to contagious caprine, briefly, contagious caprine pleuropneumonia. It is a severe disease of coat caused by mycoplasma capricolon. Some species caprinemone uh, called MCCP. So it is characterized by extreme fever, high morbidity and mortality rate in susceptible hearts affecting all ages and abortions in pregnant goats. So here you can see the CCP lesion, the pleura is fully affected, fibrinous inflammation is there and when we open the animal for postmortem, we can take out the plural fluid for uh, laboratory examinations. So then sheep and goat pox, sheep and goat pox, both are viral disease of sheep and goats causing fever, generalized peptides or nodules, vesicles 
and internal lesions, vesicles are rarely seen, mostly productive lesions are there, so papules, solid nodules of papules are seen, and particularly lungs, sebum pneumonia and death. So see the specific characteristic lesions of the seed box or goat box. This is a picture of goat box. Scaps on the lesions uh, on the skin, then skin ulceration is there. You, you can see the face, spoke lesions on the face uh, and lesions on the margin. And here in the lung, we can see characteristic gunshot lesions, which are very characteristic for pox, seed pox especially. So uh, these characteristic gunshot lesions, they are characterized by very central dark hyperemic uh, area surrounded by a uh, lighter uh, hyperemic area. So that's how we are very characteristic lesions. And they, even once you find these in postmortem, you can say this is a pox. They are pathognomic also. Pathognomic means just by seeing the lesion, we can name the disease. So now coming to blue tongue, blue tongue virus infection involves domestic and wild ruminant like sheep, goat, cattle, buffalo, deer, and most species of optical antelopes and various other uh, are the old reptile and vertebra host. Disease is more severe in sheep than goats. Uh, just the way the PPR is more severe in goats here, blue tongue is more severe in sheep than goats. Uh, it is insect borne viral infection. Uh, in the vast majority of infected animals, it is quite inapparent, but causes fatal disease in a proportion of infected sheep, deer, and wild ruminants. So here you can see the blue tongue lesions. Major discharge is there, mucoprolent, bloody discharge, then congestion of lips and gums, and inflammation of coronary gland. This is very characteristic for blue tongue, blue tongue lesions. So again, you can see here inflammation over corona, coronitis, then conjunctivitis, and the lesions in the uh, esophagus. Now, coming to the foot and mouth disease, foot and mouth disease, or uh, this particular uh, picture shows you the erosive lesions caused by the foot and mouth virus. Foot and mouth virus is basically an epitheliotropic virus. So, epithelial cells it affects, especially mucosal and uh, hoof. So, that's how it causes lesions in the foot and mouth. Then, endotoxemia is an acute and subacute bacterial disease in coat and sheep, causing high motility and economic losses. In dead animals, after postmortem, the intestine can be cut and ligated at both the hands and sent to the eyes to the laboratory for identification of possible toxins produced by the Clostridium parthenogenes type D. So that's how endotoxemia can be diagnosed. Here one picture shows you uh, uh, subacute of chronic endotoxemia lesions, having neurological lesions, opisthotonus, uh, animal can show that portion. So these are the postmortem lesions. You can see the hemorrhagic diarrhea, then uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, intestines, here again, uh, even boat colon, colon is also highly affected. Uh, then you can see the potential hemorrhages over the epicardium, then lung very severely congested. You can see chymotic and potential both kind of hemorrhage over kidney and specific of clostridium, clostridium D uh, toxemia, which is also called pulpy kidney because uh, this toxin causes very fast necrosis of the medullary uh, epithelial cells of the these uh, collecting ducts. So that's how medulla autolysis uh, causes the misshapen of the kidney. So that's how it is called pulpy kidney. The kidney becomes pulpy, and when you keep it on the floor or on the palm, the kidney uh, loses its shape. So it becomes just like a portly or rounded. Uh, we can see the meningitis, even congested brain, and here again the corticomedullary junction uh, hemorrhage in the kidney. So, some more pictures of endotoxemia, very severely congested intestines, in both the cases. The hemorrhagic arthritis in the large intestine. Uh, then, coming to caseous lymphadenitis. Caseous lymphadenitis again. 
a very important disease of both sheep and goat, where lymph nodes become purulent, they have a supported inflammation, they become purulent, pus form. So here we can see the affected lymph nodes having pus. Then parasitic disease. Again, in small ruminants, especially goat and sheep, the parasitic diseases are very, very important. Uh, and these are some of the diseases that I have listed here, Senora cerebralis, echinocrotosis liver, fasciolosis liver. You can see the necrotic tracts of the migratory tracts of the fasciola flux here, cysti cerebrospinoculi in liver. And again, here is the echinocrotosis liver. So now coming to, to the disease management, uh, disease management can be uh, done by practicing uh, certain routine uh, uh, examinations or routine checking of the heart. So daily we need to check for these eight welfare indicators which have been enumerated by the experience, experienced researchers. These eight indicators are dull demeanor, dirty rear, dirty belly, skin irritation, wool loss, excessive panting, coughing, and limbness. If you observe the animals daily for these eight parameters, you will be able to uh, take out the animal, affected animals and then uh, they can be accordingly treated. So clinical examination can be done if it is ponding, lung auscultation can be done uh, which is important component of clinical examination. So I think medicine people are very much aware of this thing, how this auscultation is done. So in lung, uh, a recent study showed that uh, they have recorded the lung sounds and compared them with the uh, anti-mortem ultrasonography findings and post-mortem pathological findings. So based on these findings, the author showed that increased audibility of normal lung sounds was associated with the hyperventilation either due to toxemia or due to management reasons like stress or handling stress. If there is coarse crackles, we are heard in the advanced cases of ovine pulmonary adenocarcinoma. Then mild crackling with forced respiration, it could be pneumonia. So then we come to the vaccination aspect, the vaccines which are available to control the important bacterial and viral diseases in the small ruminants like PPR, live attenuated vaccine is there, seapox and goatpox vaccine is there, then HS vaccine is there inactivated for both the animals, then blue tongue inactivated animal, uh, inactivated vaccine is there, a PEMD inactivated vaccine is there for enterotoxemia, Toxoid, uh, inactivity of toxoid is there. Uh, so these and FMD, both the animals can be vaccinated with the available vaccines to prevent from the highly contagious disease. Then parasitic diseases. Goats parasitized by diverse range of parasites. With well over 150 species of internal and external parasites reported worldwide, most important endoparasite disease seen in sheep and goat is gastrointestinal nematosis. So it is caused by a range of GI nematodes as it has a significant cost for goat farming. So it is very important to manage the endoparasitism in small ruminant farming, goat farming or sheep farming. Checking parasite load periodically is very, very important, especially PG. Uh, X per gram or OPG, OCIST per gram of cases before deworming and after deworming. Then rotation of endowment rigs should be done uh, to uh, check from to check the check from developing the endowment resistance. Then target deworming is done by reading the conjunctival mucous membrane using one Pamacha chart. I will come on this later. Then deworming only the affected animal that is called selective deworming. So only affected animals are dewormed using EPG and Pamachacha. So these are the important parasites for small ruminants like hemonchosis, very, very important, fasciolosis, coccidiosis, then tapeworms like monigia and tinea hydridigena. 
and lung worms, pityocollus, malarias, protostomylus, histocollus, and sinorosis. So fecal egg count is one method by which we can see the worm load in the animals. Uh, so over 1000 dBg of is indicative of heavy infections, over 500 dBg moderate infections. So accordingly, we can treat the animals. So this is the Pharmacha which I, I was talking about. Uh, Pharmacha is the chart uh, for checking the anemia in the animal, uh, especially in goat. Uh, so this chart actually has five scoring of the uh, conjunctival colors, right, uh, pale white to deep red. So accordingly, just by comparing with this chart, this conjunctival, conjunctival mucosa, we can say whether uh, which score we should we give it, like uh, 2 or 5, accordingly the treatment is done. If it is 3 and uh, above, uh, normally deworming is given. Okay. So, actually, Pharmac is used especially for Himamkas, which is also called Barber Port 1. It has hooks and with these hooks, it is attached, it is attached with the major mucosa. So this chart shows you uh, the worm egg count. So if in uh, EPG, if we find uh, these many worms, so estimated, these many worms are there, and per day, this much blood is being lost. So with that, you can see 0 0.05 ml of worm in a day, uh, can you 0 0.05 ml of host blood? So, accordingly, if it is a 5000, it is very severe 50 ml blood per day loss. So, severe anemia. So, that's how the animal is bigger. Even animal die also with severe acute anemia. So, that's how uh, we use Homaja chart to treat for anemia and give deworming. Endhalmenthic resistance, we are testing. Uh, then, this testing is also done. Because uh, endalmentics are there, but uh, these worms have developed uh, resistance. So accordingly, uh, these are the tests which to by which we can test whether this drug is uh, uh, resistant, has been developed resistance or not. So endalmentic resistance test like this, uh, bench test, fecal egg count reduction test. I think uh, paracetamolist uh, can tell you in deep. So I taken just methodology to tell you in general uh, the drench test, fecal egg count reduction test, and larval developmental test. They can be done to check and elementic resistance in anyone. So there are different uh, protocols and methodology to do this. Coming to ectoparasites uh, like ticks, uh, mange, soroptic mange, uh, sarcoptic mange, then blowfly strike like meiosis uh, or uh, uh, caused by larvae of fly like Ucilla califora and lice infestations and flea strikes. So these ectoparasites has to be checked by dipping. So mange or ectoparasites can be checked by using pyrethroids like cypermethrin uh, 0 0.05 to 0.1 percent for dipping. And then pour on of preparations for the trainings. Uh, CIRG we practice regular every six monthly dipping and deworming practice. I think all organized farm must uh, practice such health management uh, as a part of health management. The environment burning with wood savings, paddy straw and spraying organophosphorus compounds, 1000 ppm into the cracks and crevices in surrounding area trichosis. So this is how to manage the ectoparasites because it's not only the skin of the animal or hair coat of the animal. These parasites, uh, these ectoparasites, they are also lurk inside the crevices and cracks in the floor or walls of the shelter or housing. So that, so that way the housing should also be cleaned regularly. Keep control of dogs, check their entry into the farm. Huh? Likewise, abortions are still work. Again, as I told you in the start, that abortions are very important in small animals. 
there could be sometimes episodic abortions, especially in brucellosis, we call it abortion storms, uh, or they could be sporadic. So main causes are brucella militancies, listeria, chlamydia, uh, CAE in boats, of course not in our country, but it is there very much. Then uh, CPOX, GOATPOX, PPR, FMD, they can also in severe form induce abortions and coxyl, coxyl, coxyl abernitae and mycoplasma genitalis, they can cause abortions. So here is one picture showing you the samples taken from uh, abortion uh, caused by brucella. So this is the slide, brucella species aborted from aborted content. Uh, then modified gene national staining showing so brucella organisms actually macrophage is filled with brucella organisms. Then you can see in the male uh, orchitis caused by brucella. Then managing abortions, so there is no vaccine for any main causes like brucella melitensis and listeria species. Actually, for listeria, we have one strain and they used brucella was used in Western countries, uh, was not that much effective. Then, so we just test them and cull them. This is a strategy in India. We, of course, nowadays, under this uh, National Animal Disease Control Program for FMD and brucellosis controlling program is going on, where they are using cotton-19 brucella abortus strain uh, for vaccine. But uh, for goat, actually, brucella melitensis is important, so that vaccine uh, may not be very effective. So that's how just test and cull or slaughter. So this is how we test them. One is to 40 and above titers. Once it is there, the animals are recommended for culling and slaughter. So in the end, to conclude, uh, following precautions to be taken to maintain the health of goats. Prevent contact with infected livestock, avoid overcrowding in the shed, keep the kids separate from the adults, isolate sick goats, avoid equipment used for ailing goats being brought into the goat shed, then prevent unhygienic people from walking around in the goat shed, get an accurate and early diagnosis of disease if any from a qualified veterinarian, avoid unnecessary medication, consider droppings as potential source of diseases. Then eliminate ticks, lice, mites, and control predatory animals. Keep the house clean and dry. Keep the feed and water uncontaminated. Ensure periodic vaccinations and maintain record of incidence of disease and treatments given. So this is how we can manage our health in a hard goat herd or sheep. So we are the references I have taken from some and some acknowledgements from my previous institute, CIRG uh, Magdam, as well as from IVRI Grant Institute. So you can see here one flock of Chang Thangi goat. These pictures I took when I uh, visited Ladakh, traveled to Ladakh. And uh, this is Ipex, wild goat. These are also uh, seen in the Ladakh region. So with that, I thank you very much. I think you people must have enjoyed this lecture. If you have any doubt or queries, I'll be happy to uh, clear you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for a very comprehensive and informative lecture. And you covered all the aspects of health management. And in fact, very small, minor, minor things, but very important things were also covered. So I hope the participants, they must have benefited. and. Uh, uh, now I would like to request the participants if they have any questions they can either write in the chat box or directly ask, sir. The chat box I am not able to see here. Sir, you can maybe unshare and then... Yeah. Uh, I will answer. Yes. yes, sir. Stop presenting. Yes, sir. 
so everybody is appreciating because i also felt very small minor things which were covered uh, which are of practical use while working with the goats so but i would like that if some participants they ask some questions also yeah those who are working in some area of maybe disease or management like that because i saw from the list there are a lot of people from uh, i think we have covered all disciplines so yes, how many sir. audiences they are attending this because list has around 120 125 candidates so 130 participants were there at one time oh yes sir. very huge Yeah, 121 participants are still there. They are there. Yes, sir. It's a good strength. I hope all will be benefited with this. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, sir. So, sir, I think if there are no questions, then, uh, then shall you we can... stop? Or? Okay, okay. You have another one lecture? No, no, sir. Only this. In the afternoon. Okay. There are some pathologists also. If they are, they are in the as participants. If they want to ask any question or others also, please. They, you're all welcome. Yeah, take your time. I'm here. You can ask me. <laughs> Make up your mind what to ask. <laughs> 